So this is a slightly grab bag lecture, but it's thinking about what you do when you have a lot of variables in your data set. So I often think about multidimensional data as uh, the sort of shape or size of data. So when people talk about big data, I think of that as really tall data, data that has many, many observations, many rows, millions or billions of rows. Uh, and many corporations have what I would consider big data. So much too large to fit on one computer, it needs to be distributed in some way. So that data is tall, if you think about the shape of the data. Um, but when I think about multidimensional data, I think of that as being wide data. It has lots of variables. Many different dimensions have been recorded about it. And of course, data can be both uh, sort of tall and wide, but um, I'm more interested in the problem of visualizing really wide data. If you have that tall data, you have a different type of problem. It's not really a visualization problem, it's a computational problem. Like, what are you gonna do uh, with all that data? Are you gonna try and um, uh, aggregate it in some way? Because you won't be able to display each one of many observations as individual data points. So if you just have two uh, quantitative variables, of course, you could make a scatter plot. And then if you had more variables, one thing you could do is you could add color, uh, you know, to add a third variable that was a categorical variable. We've seen that you could also add shape as a way to uh, map some variable into the visual space, but you kind of run out of visual attributes in two dimensions pretty quickly. So one option would be to add a third dimension. So if you've taken a statistics uh, modeling class with me, you may have seen me use this R package RGL, which lets you do 3D uh, visualizations. Um, it's not super user-friendly, it's kind of clunky. I don't think it's something that you would really wanna uh, present to your boss, but it lets you visualize another uh, dimension of data. Um, another way to visualize lots of variables is to make like a scatterplot matrix. So this is just a generic scatterplot matrix from R. Um, and of course, you wouldn't have to visualize every single variable. You could just select a few different variables that you wanted and make that pairs plot. Um, I'm not sure if we've talked about the generalized pairs plots, but this is a generalization of the pairs plots that works for more than just quantitative variables. So when I was looking at this uh, pairs plot, these were all uh, scatter plots. So it was assuming that cut was a quantitative variable, even though it actually looks uh, categorical. There's only one, two, three, four, five categories there. So um, there might be a better way to represent that data. So the GG pairs, uh, which is the generalized pairs plot, um, it lets you see scatter plots if there's two quantitative variables, side-by-side uh, -side box plots if you've got a quantitative and a categorical. It lets you see, I think, kind of mosaic plots if you have two um, categorical variables. They're a little bit strange here. Um, and then along the, uh, the diagonal, you get to see the the distribution of the one variable, so just the one-dimensional uh, histogram or density plot visualization of a numeric variable like caret or the bar chart for something uh, like cut uh, or color or clarity, and then we go back to these density plots. So a lot of information gets packed into a generalized pairs plot, and again you could just select a couple variables um, and then that would be easier for you to see. I think that generalized pairs plots uh, give you a lot of information as an analyst, and I would really recommend them as part of your exploratory data analysis. But again, I don't know that this is what you wanna to present to your boss or put in your piece of data journalism. Um, it's kind of a lot of information. Uh, going back to the idea of kind of 3D modeling, um, there are systems that let you do almost like 3D visualization, but for more than three dimensions. So this is an old tool. I think I might have shown this to you in my history lecture. Um, this is John Tukey's hand. He's using a light pen, which was a way to interact with computers back in the day. 
and he is going to rotate some nine-dimensional data. He's basically doing projections down into lower dimensional spaces. So then you can almost visualize in sort of a 2D or 3D way the way the data looks in nine dimensions. Um, it's a really fascinating video if you want to go uh, learn more about it. I'll try and stick it into our playlist in case you want to take a look. Um, so this is a way to use some, some kind of interactivity to let you see more variables. And this has been implemented in R as well as the Grand Tour. Um, so this is a visualization sort of showing how some of these uh, variables are being collapsed together to form projections. Uh, and it just goes through a bunch of random projections to show you what the data might look like in, in many dimensional space. So in this case, I'm looking at the diamonds data, the variables caret, depth, table, x, y, and z. So that's six variables. It's, I'm in six dimensional space and then I'm getting uh, a grand tour of what that data looks like in many different projections. Again, this is maybe more for your use as an analyst and less uh, for, for presentation. Um, I love the CSV fingerprint. This is an idea by Victor Powell of looking at an entire data set to see where there is maybe missing data, um, different data types, um, and it lets you kind of look at an overview of a whole data set. A similar idea in R would be table plots. So this is from the tab plot package. So this shows you like kind of a density of one variable and then the distribution of all the other variables along. So you might be able to see relationships between many variables at once. Um, and you can sort by a different variable. By default, it sorts by the first one, but I could sort by color. Um, and then I might be able to see some trends in like depth based on color or clarity based on color, for example. But if we're going to do things that are more for public consumption, uh, those methods might not be the most effective. And so we have a few other strategies that are more useful for a general audience. One of them is animation. So you can use animation as a way to encode data. So uh, sort of mapping. So this is a visualization of the wind. Um, it's by Fernando Villegas and Martin Wattenberg. And in this visualization, we have sort of the x-axis and the y-axis. We've got our sort of geographic coordinates. And then we can see an animation of what the wind looks like. I guess I didn't actually put an animation into this slideshow. So I'm going to see if I can open it up in my browser. So here's what the wind looks like right now. Uh, and the animation is letting me see where the speed of the wind is. So the number of lines helps denote how fast the wind is going. Um, and I can really see the patterns over the space of the country um, and, uh, and maybe some geographic features as well. So uh, that's a nice use of animation as an encoding. Another one that I like is this visualization by Nathan Yao about the growth of Walmart. And this shows, again, it's a map. Uh, so we've got uh, the geographic coordinates as one ax or as two axes here. And then we're uh, putting dots on the map where uh, Walmart or Sam's Club opened. But then we're able to visualize even one more variable, which is time, by doing an animation. So you can see the number of stores appearing, uh, and then you can see how they uh, persist over time. So in this case, we're able to show the latitude and longitude, that's two variables. Um, we're able to show the year, and then the color represents whether it is a Walmart or a Sam's Club. So I think that the, the green ones are um, the Walmart or Sam's Club. So we're visualizing basically four variables all at once, and we're able to see that pattern uh, by using the animation to display the, the time variable. And I'll just let it play out. I don't think it quite goes up to the present. Um, this is kind of an older visualization of Nathan's, uh, but it'll get pretty close. It's pretty cool to watch. Uh, and I think that the length of time that it takes is also kind of impactful. Like he could have just shown, um, you know, three time points, for example, uh, but he chose to uh, show you the whole uh, time, you know, every year um, as, 
has maybe a second in the in that video. I've also seen uh, animation used as an encoding in terms of political maps. Uh, and it seems like all these examples are maps. But so this is an, an old piece from the New York Times. And I actually don't think that the animation is available anymore because this is an archived page. I think it was using some old web technology. But it actually showed the animation of the arrows of the, the shift uh, per county um, for, for votes in, in 2012. Um, and I've seen the New York Times is still doing some visualizations like this, but the one from the 2020 election, it's no longer an animation. They just have the arrows. Uh, so maybe this it doesn't fit right in this section, but it is showing more variables because it's showing the position of the county. It's showing the um, whether the county went for Biden or Trump. And then it's showing uh, how much of a shift there was uh, between the 2016 and 2020 election. So again, showing lots of variables at once. Um, you could also use an animation as a transition. So if you were going to move uh, from one type of sorting to another, you can use animation so that your eye can kind of follow the, uh, the bars as they move. Uh, you could use that uh, when you're transitioning between visualization types. Uh, so this is again a New York Times example, um, and they're using these uh, balls to represent pieces of the budget. And then the, the visualization type really changes, um, but they're using animation to connect together so you could watch one of those bubbles uh, as it moves. So it's not an encoding, it's not showing particular data, uh, but it is helping us keep track of pieces of the visualization. Another way that you could show uh, more data is by using iteration. So the most common version of this is called small multiples. And with small multiples, you make the same plot many times for different subsets of the data. So I really liked this uh, visualization, uh, which is small multiple plots for every state in the United States, and then showing the same graph. So they could have shown this all on one picture and it would have just been a bunch of spaghetti. But by showing small multiples, it's actually possible for us to track these trends and see where people are dying sooner or dying uh, later than, uh, than before. Um, I'm asking you to watch a short version of Lena Groger's Small Things talk. Uh, she also has a 25 minute one, which I think is totally worth watching. Maybe I'll stick that in the playlist as well as an optional one. But she has some great things to say about small multiples, so I'll just let her say that. Um, and then you could use interactivity. So uh, the animations that we've seen so far, they're not really interactive. You just watch them unfold, but interactivity can also help uh, show more variables or better relationships between variables. So uh, there is a paper that um, lists out a number of types of interaction. And I just wanted to show you each of these types and then an example of how I see it. So uh, there is select as a type of interaction. And I think you're reading this coordinated highlighting in context, but um, if, you, uh, if you select, you're maybe highlighting something that you see as interesting. And if you have uh, coordinated highlighting, then you're able to see, you know, I highlighted these two points in the scatter plot, and that is showing the same highlights in all the other connected plots. Uh, so it's, it's making that connection between the variables. An explorer would be something that would uh, show you something else. So one way that you could do this is by scroll bars. So this is something called scrolly telling, where as you scroll through a piece of visualization, things change. Uh, this is from the pudding and it's showing a screenplay dialogue from Disney movies. And as you scroll, uh, you're sort of interacting with the visualization. You're seeing more and more pieces. Um, you could also pan around, you could step through some uh, stages, uh, and you could do a direct walk, like click on a hyperlink and get taken somewhere else. That's a way of exploring. Reconfigure, that would be sort of like reordering. So here in Tableau, um, reordering the list by a particular um, value. Uh, and that could be a way that you would interact with a visualization, is to reorder it. 
Uh, you can have an interaction where you are doing a different encoding. So say, you know, you as the user are saying, show me a different representation. Um, and that example with the bubbles from the New York Times, I think that those were different kinds of representation. It went from a bubble chart to a kind of dot plot. Um, and then I also think about this piece from uh, Nathan Yao that we saw a few weeks ago, earlier in the semester, um, one data set visualized 25 ways. So this isn't actually an example of interaction with encoding, but it shows you how you could uh, give someone multiple ways to visualize the same data. Um, there's also abstract elaborate, which is kind of show me more or less detail. And I really love this piece from the New York Times where it detects the zip code that you are in. So I think I took this screenshot when I was living in Massachusetts um, and it's showing me detail about the place where I was. Um, and so it's able to give me the right level of detail because it knows where I am. Um, there's also tool tips. Um, I think of that as a way to abstract or elaborate. So you could see the bar for Texas and it's got the, you know, sort of big picture, but then you could hover over it and it would give you more detail. That's a way of interacting. Um, filter would be some way of like showing something conditionally. I think of the baby name Voyager, which lets you start typing your name in and then it shows you the graph uh, as you go. So uh, this is the graph with just the letters AM and you can really see the peak of babies named Amanda kind of around the time that I was born. Um, Amelia was not nearly as popular in that time period. Uh, and then I think I mentioned uh, coordinated highlighting. So um, if you are using uh, some, you know, like selection, painting over what you're interested in, if you have the connection between all the pieces, then it's going to allow you to see the relationship between those variables. So those are just a few strategies for trying to visualize more than two or three variables uh, by using uh, some strategies that work uh, for you as you're analyzing data and some that are better for representing it to a final audience.